I am really happy to see you all, and we are in for a treat today. Um, my name is Eric Owens, and I'm the director of the International Studies Program here, and I teach in the Theology Department also. And um, I also have been uh, fortunate over the past three years or so to host this series called the Global Citizenships Workshops that uh, Sister Marianne Lockery is joining us for today. And uh, this has been a really special uh, series of events for us over the years. Um, the intent behind it is to bring into an intimate setting like this a small scale uh, conversation with an extraordinary woman or man who has shown what a life of service can mean and is able to articulate in profound ways the challenges and the sacrifices that come with a life of service and uh, and the joys and privileges that come with it as well. Um, one of our first guests in this series was Ophelia Dahl, who's the founder of Partners in Health, co-founder of Partners in Health. And many of you may have seen yesterday that uh, her co-founder, Paul Farmer, passed away mm. unexpectedly overnight. And it's a grievous loss for the humanitarian world and for public health uh, in general. Um, if you haven't read about his life uh, or his work, I really encourage you to do that. Um, he's a friend of Boston College and uh, probably a friend of Marianne's mm -hmm. um, and uh, someone who's been here many times on campus as well. So um, it's, a, it's a terrible loss for the, for the global community, for sure. Um, I'd like to start today by having you all introduce yourselves and then we'll spend the next uh, 45 minutes or an hour uh, in conversation with Sister Lockery and, um, and then we will uh, break out into small groups and talk a bit about some of the things we've talked about here, along with your own vocational interests and uh, uh, career ideas or challenge, moral challenges you're facing, et cetera. Then we'll come back and you can ask those direct questions of her or any specific things or ask her how you can get into Australia when it's so hard to get there, <laughs> uh, et cetera, something like that. Gotta um, marry them. That's right, you gotta marry an Australian. Uh, um, uh, or reborn to one, right, <laughs> Elizabeth? Yeah. Uh, so why don't we start by introducing yourselves? Tell us, uh, you know, tell us your name and program, uh, class year, and um, you know if there's any connection with the uh, theme of migration or refugees or anything else you'd like to lift up before we get started. That would be great. Well, what a great group we have. Yes. Thank you all for being hey. here. It's a it's a real pleasure, and um, um, it's such an honor to be with you, uh, Thank Sister you. Lockery, Marianne. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we'll find out. You've all seen uh, Sister Lockery's bio online, and uh, this isn't a CV uh, conversation, it's a life conversation. And so, um, but I think it, before we really dig into some of these big picture questions, let's just help people understand what it is you do. Like, what, what are some of the um, primary professional roles you have right now? Okay, well, thank you. First of all, thanks for being here, and thanks for all the interests that you have. Um, because they obviously cross over with a lot that I have. Um, I think right now, um, you'd have to say that I play a lot of advisory roles. Um, so I, um, I do still have a, an active role occasionally, but it's, not, it's pretty obvious I'm ageing. Um, so I'm on a lot of boards. So I'm on the board of the, um, like tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., I'm on the governing committee of the International Catholic Migration Commission, ICMC. It's based in Geneva. It's got Vatican component. And I'm the treasurer. It's a $48 million budget. Um, and it's run by bishops and cardinals. So that's one example. <coughs> In Australia, I'm on two um, advisory boards where I'm an advisor for the Caldor Refugee Law Centre and also for the um, Statelessness Centre. One's at University of New <coughs> South Wales, one is at um, Melbourne University. And then here in Washington, I'm, a, I'm chair the Mental Health and Psychosocial <coughs> Advisory Group for Jesuit Refugee Service. Um, then I teach here about um, global issues um, in the School of Social Work. And um, what else am I on? Um, I'm also a, a fellow at Oxford. Or you yeah, no, I'm a fellow of Campion Hall, Oxford. I just came from Oxford on Wednesday. So I, um, and I teach in the Refugee Studies Centre at Oxford. Thank you for reminding me. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind, of, I kind of nowadays have moved from um, being 
much more in the field, which I was when I was younger, to mentoring people who are going to go into the field. And maybe if I can just, Eric, elaborate that, Please. Um, and I'll come back to it, but like last year when the Afghans arrived, I went to the um, forts and I worked in the emergency setting for a month. But then I realized, you know, there's others who can do better than this. So there's at least now five graduates of BC who continue to work and I just support them. So I'm happy to do the work initially, but I can see that there's others who can now do the work much longer. And tomorrow we're having drinks with them on, by Zoom to thank them for their work. So I kind of do that sort of work now, if that helps. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk a little bit more, uh, a bit more about that. First, tell us uh, what kind of tools you bring to that work. You have a PhD in psychology, mm. right? And tell us a little bit about what how that relates to the work that you do? I think um, the way I actually got into this work um, and is, is that I was actually training as a psychologist. So I was at a university um, and I had a part-time job and, and I was trying to get, we have to get hours in order to, clinical hours in order to get registered. And I started working overseas to get more clinical hours in summer. Like I'd do a month's work here and in refugee camps, mainly for CDC actually here in the US. So it's um, the unique way that I started um, has actually got me to here where I'm still a psychologist. I've got a doctorate in psychology, but I've got my credit from working in all sorts of settings. Um, that is unusual. Like um, I've been in most, of the conflict settings in the last decades. And so that means that I kind of um, bring not only the lens of psychology, but I've got some insight as to what that looks like in lots of parts of the world that are in danger sort of thing. So uh, I think I've heard your work or you've described your work as, as investigating the psychosocial impact of refugees and migrants. Could you give it, put a little, um, yeah. Have onto that description of what it's like for you, especially when you were uh, more in the field. Uh, what what does that day to day look like uh, going into a camp or dealing working with refugees? Well, I'll give two stories that can help explain that. The first one is the first camp I worked in was when I was, as I say, training to be a psychologist, and I was in the Philippines, and that was a what they called a resettlement camp for the Indochinese, the Vietnamese, the Khmer and the Laotians. And I don't know if you know, and I'm not even sure of the current situation, but what happens is if people are gonna be resettled and they were coming primarily to the US or Norway, that if people have any impairment, they have to be assessed and sometimes families can't come forward if, they, if their family members seen as having a, um, a burden on the society that's going to accept them. So they have to be assessed and then the family sometimes has to commit to paying for the medical costs or whatever. So I remember the first time I really encountered that was a woman who um, sat cross-legged on a chair and she had, um, she was probably younger than I am now, she had hardly any teeth and um, they asked me to see, she was an older woman then um, in the camp they asked me to see if she had um, an intellectual disability. Now, normally if somebody has an intellectual disability, we assess them with intelligence tests and blocks and um, puzzles. You've probably done some of these. And I realized that this woman had never held a pencil. Like she was from, she was from the Hmong group. And she, I was trying to think, how can I benevolently assess her, but still assess her because if she comes here and she's found to have an intellectual impairment, it will go against my professional sort of judgment. So I had to do it fairly um, and how to actually um, do it fairly, but to make sure that I was being professional. Um, anyway, I mean, the, the quick story is I went to her house to see if she was functioning, well, the house isn't exaggerate, the little hut where she was living. And I assessed that she didn't have an intellectual disability, that she was a simple woman who hadn't an education. Fast forward to then to the most of the refugee settings, I never talked to 
one-on-one -on -one people or assess one-on-one -on -one because normally I'm in settings where there's thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. So um, in that setting, the idea of doing any mental health or psychiatric work or counselling is impossible because one, I don't have the languages and secondly, um, we'd be overwhelmed. So then I've moved to this model of how can we help people to help themselves, community-based work, and how can we see the strengths of the community rather than looking for the deficits, which is the mental health or the um, signs of um, um, symptomatic um, mental health signs. So I, I primarily work in the area of <coughs> promoting resilience, community-based strength, and it, recognize that a small proportion do have mental health problems, but if they do, um, we refer them. Um, so I've got used to working with thousands. So when I sit on planes and people say, oh, well, you know, what do you do? And I say, I'm a psychologist. People always go Ugh, like that, or they say, oh, and want to tell me stuff. And so I quickly now say, and I work with thousands rather than one-on-one -on -one to try to, um, sort of get away from people thinking I'm analysing them. I'm not at all, I'm more looking at systems straight away, yes. Is an occupational hazard studying religion also when you're on a plane? Or yes. yes. want to talk to you on yes. the flight for eight hours. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so this is a great start to, yep. to this and give us a little bit of picture. And I hope you'll continue to give us examples of the places around the world you've worked as we have our conversations. It's, we can't go through every of the no, no, 50 no, places yeah. you've, you've worked around the world, but uh, but don't be shy to, to bring up stories along the way. I want to uh, ask a sort of a question of origins, you know, mm. an origin story, if you will. And for you, it seems to me, normally I would ask people here, what was your moment of commitment? To that? You, where, when did you know that this was the work you needed to do, the work with refugees or the work with migrants? Mm. But for you, I also wonder, when was it that you knew that you wanted to give your life to God and work as a, a sister of mercy. Mm. And how were those two moments of commitment related? How can you, can you talk about that for a little bit? I can, but I think it will be very hard for you to relate to it because of the era. Mm. Yeah. So I went to, now don't age me when I tell you this thing. I went to school, a, a lovely um, all girls school, um, private school. Um, but we had, it was in the era of the Vietnam War and the, um, that's where I'm saying it's, it was a long time ago. It was in the era of the Vietnam War and of protest. And um, the teachers that I had, a, a number of them, so this is in the um, late, what am I saying? It was in, it's in the kind of late, I left school in 72, so it's probably 68, 69, that sort of era. And um, it was it was Dylan, Leonard Cohen. It was all protest stuff. But I was also at the same time in a kind of a school of privilege, if I can say that. Um, and I remember getting into trouble. We had what we called prefects, um, and I was a prefect. But I was seen on television outside our parliament house in uniform, protesting um, on the way home from school. <coughs> because we were protesting the Australians and the Americans being in Vietnam. And I knew a bit about it, but our teachers were really telling us a lot about it. And at the same time, and yeah, it's, it was kind of controversial, it remains controversial. We had, um, there were Sisters of Mercy in Vietnam working with orphans. And I don't know whether any of you have ever um, followed this, but. When, um, when the embassy fell in Vietnam and you see the pictures of people going up to the helicopter, some of our sisters were evacuated then and others went earlier, and there's a great book about this, uh, with the children um, and people like Mia Farrow and people like that adopted the, the children, which now is controversial about taking children out of countries. So we kind of had, what I heard when I was at school is that we had people in Vietnam, but as I say, doing something that nowadays we wouldn't promote. But we also had people protesting. And then the sisters were 
and this is again, I mean, I don't know if you can relate to it, but it was also when the church was starting to change around what we call Vatican II. Um, and so the sisters stopped wearing habits um, or made modified habits. And they started working in Australia with, at the same time with indigenous people and um, with um, poorer people. And so my elite school suddenly became one where we're having all these people coming in and tell us about um, different classes and different systems and poverty. And so I was kind of torn in the two systems. Um, I mean, my family is not from an elite family, but we were in, in school, we were told we could do anything. And it was one of the, all women, and in those days you could, if you wanted to do law, you did law, if you wanted to do medicine, you know, like you, you could do it. Um, but we had this conflict of what was happening in our world and we were being taught that at the same time. So that's one part of the story. Then <coughs> the next part of the story is when I went to university in, in um, Adelaide, in Australia, it was just turmoil because they were protesting and they were, all the students were protesting and we were also, um, you know, going out and um, teaching um, refugees English and um, working, building houses for the poor and, so we were doing that sort of work as well as being at uni. So it just kind of perpetuated what I'd been taught a bit at school. And it just seemed like we all wanted to make a better world, literally. And most of my friends from that era have continued to do that in their own <coughs> different ways. You know, like they so it was, it was the times, if I can say that. Um, I was a great disappointment to my family in doing it. <laughs> Because they were, my, my parents were not supportive of what I did. Yeah. Um, they were accepting but not supportive. Yeah. Supportive of your uh, commitment to the church or supportive of your work with vulnerable populations or off the corporate yeah. business they, professional track? I think they just didn't, um, they didn't think being a sister was a good idea, though they liked sisters, but as long as it wasn't their own daughter. Um, because they saw it as my <coughs> turning away from marriage mm -hmm. and had I seen something in their marriage that I didn't want. Um, but also, um, yeah, I was, gonna, I was going away to places that people didn't go to. Um, it's a little bit dangerous. You'd go to, you know, housing commission, you know, places that you didn't normally, my, my parents would have protected me from and yet I was actively going to it. Plus I have to say, my parents hadn't been to university, so that they saw university as a pretty dangerous place, which it was, <laughs> thanks goodness. So I was caught up in all that churn as such, yeah. Really interesting, thank you. So what kinds of challenges were in front of you early on in your career? What did you, many of, many of you will leave Boston College with the fire mm -hmm. of justice behind you, and you'll wanna make change in the world and something you'll run up against some sorts of problems. We all do in, what, in, what, in the kind of work that we do. And um, what were some of those early problems that you faced, whether it was cultural or professional or the gender hierarchies that you were working with at the time or? That um, became apparent later. Okay. No, I think, um, how do I say this? Um, com compromise is what comes to my mind. Like nothing's pure. So we, we were always, every situation warranted lots of discussion. Are we doing the right thing? Are we, um, is this what we should be doing? It's a bit like what I said earlier about the, um, you know, looking after orphans in Vietnam. It seems a good idea until you really think about it. And then you think, well, I'm not sure that's the right thing to do. Well, the same thing, I think we were, um, white saviors, if I can say that for some communities, but we didn't know, um, or we were naive. We didn't think of the big system. And maybe another example is when I joined the convent, um, which was only after first year at university. So when I was in second year at university, you're still allowed to just go to uni. So it was like not too different. But then the next year, I was sent to a place in Sydney that was a centre for alcoholic Aboriginal people. And now I had barely ever met an Aboriginal person in my life, or if I had, I didn't even know. Um, and suddenly I was working with 
the Redfern Medical Centre and a famous priest who's now gone to heaven called Father Ted and Mum Cheryl, the Aboriginal woman. And they would say, oh, Sister Man, we want you to take this guy to court. So I'd go to, the, I'd go to court, you know, like, or can you go and visit this person in the juvenile detention centre? So I'd go to the juvenile detention I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and so I had, I learnt by doing um, as such, and I'm sure I did lots of mistakes and said, like I didn't have the right language, I didn't know how to dress, how to behave. Um, and I was with people who, I remember once there was a, um, some incident and they came and knocked on my door, are you still okay, are you alive? Yeah, yeah, I'm alive, you know. <laughs> and meanwhile, there was a Jesuit who tied his sheets together and was gonna go out the window because he was, you know, so there were, I just was naive and I think compromised a bit because um, I got thrown in the deep end and I had to swim. And I'm sure I didn't swim well um, until I started to get a sense of peers and um, talking about what we're doing and is this good to do or not. So there wasn't, it's not like as if there's a road map. And also, if I can say, Eric, even now I'm much more aware of all the things we have to be careful of, but if you stay on the really straight and narrow, you don't do this sort of work. So it's that kind of, um, to say, the deep end was what I learned. And I was only in my 20s then. So um, it was it was yeah. fast. Well-behaved women rarely make history. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about the charism of your order. What is it about the Sisters of Mercy yeah. uh, that that you feel closest to and that represents their work the most? And um, and is it is it hard to be? In a, in a in a community like that, has it been has it been a challenge? Are they going to see the recording? <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll geofence it. Okay, right. It's only Americans. Yeah. <coughs> no, the, um, the and we can actually block the it. Sisters of Mercy. Now I won't remember the dates or anything like yeah. that. Were founded in Dublin, and they were founded by a, I like this bit a wealthy heiress. Um, she bought a house to deal with the women who were in servitude, so they were the um, women in the houses helping the rich, who would often get into trouble, pregnant or in sexual relations with the, um, the male of the house or whatever, and be turfed out onto the streets. And they couldn't then get another job. So she, we started what we call a house of mercy, where the women would be able to come and they would be helped to get um, a basic education so that they could move on to a better job and not be in peril. So that's how we start with Houses of Mercy. And it was women who were widows, who were wealthy. So it wasn't young people um, who started this. It was pe people of means, women of means, who wanted to help the women on the um, streets. Um, so that's how we started. And then fairly quickly, we moved from Dublin to um, like a group of the bishops, that's how it happened in those days, would say, we need sisters in X. So they'd go to X, like to another town in, Dub in Ireland. Um, and they wouldn't even talk to each other because there wasn't much, um, there, was, there weren't phones, um, they would write to each other. So that house would then do its own sort of work and become what we call autonomous. Then another, Foundation would be in England, and you've got to remember this is the times when you know women's health and women and contraception and all of that was tricky. So women, Irish women, were going back and forth to England, and so the sisters. Um, I stayed with them recently in uh, well, a year or so ago in London. They were on the wharfs where mm -hmm. people would be, the Irish would be coming. So they followed the Irish, if I can say that. But then as we morphed. Um, they started um, like a rich school in order to look after a poor school. So we'd often have a school like the one I went to that then financed a school for people who couldn't afford to go to a wealthier school. Then they started hospitals and clinics. And nowadays we more work with um, women, where well, we still have the schools and the hospitals, but we have a lot of um, women's shelters and domestic um, violence set, um, shelters, but we have a Mercy Refugee Service where I've done a lot of work 
Um, we work in, um, we've worked a lot with our indigenous populations in Australia. We've been, in, we're in the Argentine, we're in Peru, we're in New Zealand. So we're in English speaking countries where the Irish sort of went. So I thought they were pretty cool what they were doing, um, especially when they started to break away from the schools, you know, to actually doing other work, which is when I was at school. But um, I can't say it's been easy staying in. It's not a, and now it's, now it's tough because I'm clearly, now I've said I'm old, I'm also one of the youngest um, in the sense that it's, th this life is coming to an end. There's not lots of nuns about to um, stay. So we're now making all our ministries into corporations so that um, our companies will continue to run them and we'll just kind of um, peter out. <laughs> um, so to speak. So I'm in Australia, I'm one of the young sisters, <laughs> even though I'm not young, because I think our average age is like 80 or something. Like, think about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not, not in every country it's like that, but it is in America, it is in, anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's not that easy. It sounds interesting, but it's not easy. So tell, thank you so much um, for sharing all of that. Don't show them. That. <laughs> um, they, if they're 90, they're not going to be online. <laughs> oh, no, they're the ones that watch. <laughs> um, we've, we've talked a little bit about some of the challenges that come with yep. life uh, as a sister. Um, what are the things, the biggest challenges you felt in your career as a humanitarian uh, worker, as someone who, who, who works with refugees? And how have those changed over time? Right. Well, I guess I just said it a bit earlier. We started a Mercy Refugee Service, but we, so Jesuit Refugee Service started in 1980, and it was started by some Jesuits that I knew. So even from the very beginning, I was in on what was happening at the very beginning. And the same year, we started Mercy Refugee Service. But we agreed with the Jesuits, I want you all to listen to this, that we wouldn't compete, but we'd collaborate with them. But one of the biggest challenges has been, it's always then been Jesuit Refugee Service. Like the men, the men have always um, shown the way or had the authority and um, the women have worked with the men. Now it made, good sense, but it's not been easy because we've been, um, there's some, that even in Jesuit refugee service, like um, there's some positions a woman could never fill because she's a woman or not a Jesuit. So, which is like what the church is like, if I can say that. So I kind of got myself into an organization, which I've been in now for decades, that um, because of my gender, I can't, um, do certain things and that can get quite wearisome um, I must say and um, so that's a challenge and then the church is a challenge with the same issues what was the question again well I could the, stay on the right, long time. yeah absolutely <laughs> sure uh, uh, maybe more geopolitically or more on the ground uh, the kinds of challenges you're facing well one thing that comes to my mind is the sort of uh, uh, rising fact of climate migration. Um, you've, you've dealt with mm. refugees from war mm. and conflicts of, uh, of droughts, yeah. humanitarian disasters, uh, human caused disasters, and now sort of long-term climate change, yeah. et cetera. Can you say a little bit about the sort of I think that, maybe? yeah, I can. Um, as I say, I started with the classic refugees, like the, there was, I used to say it's like the cowboys with the white hats and the black hats, like, you knew who the good guys were and you knew who the bad guys were and that everybody was fleeing communism, so they're good, or everybody's fleeing, you know, like repressive regime. Nowadays, it's nowhere near as clear who you're working with. And it got really messy early, so that sometimes I've been working with people who you do wonder whether you're working with the right side of people who fled. So that's tricky. Um, you also get very caught up in, uh, am I perpetuating the system? 
So when I worked in Hong Kong, I was in Hong Kong for three years in a detention centre. We thought whether we should be there because we were perpetuating people being detained as staff, we thought. And then the correct, uh, Hong Kong Corrections asked me if I'd work for them. And um, it's like, well, do you, do you try to help them be better or is it better not to? So those sorts of questions. Um, I've worked in Gaza for a long time, um, teaching, and um, you get very conflicted with the Israelis and the Palestinians, <coughs> and where are you in the politics of it? Mm -hmm. um, I'll never forget when I worked with the people out of Rwanda, are you working with people who perpetuated the genocide or not? And that was a big question for us. So then, I, I mean, I can go on and on about the countries where I've worked, where you're, it's not clear, um, where you should be, who you should be working with. And I'm a psychologist, so I'm trying to work, um, you can't really work neutrally. And I really tell my students, you have to be well informed about the setting that you're in. Mm -hmm. But you are also just trying to be a professional, um, but not in a setting where you're actually doing further harm politically. <coughs> and. It just goes on like that. So even with climate now, um, like, well, no, go back. Like, so then I spent some years being on our, in Australia, on our Minister of Immigration's Advisory Council, where I had full access to all our um, detention centres, and I just saw terrible things. And we tell the government what we were seeing, but that didn't mean we necessarily changed what we were seeing. So it's always that question about um, are you being used or are you able to bring about change? And um, in, it's a highly politicised area, even just when I was on the basis here in, I was in Wisconsin, it's very politicised, State Department, US government generals who want you to do things and you're thinking, why do they want me to do that? You know, like, what's... So you really have to be authoritative, informed, um, but also benevolent, because, you know, they're people in need. So it's a really tricky area to keep working in. Um, and um, yeah, I'm sure I've overstepped different ways at different times. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Um, what are some of the core values or lodestars or, or things that you hold closest to yourself that you can rely on when you face these challenges of am I working for the bad guys or mm. am I in the wrong place or <coughs> what I did 10 years ago isn't what I would do now what what are the things that you hold on to that are uh, most central in sustaining the work that you do right well two things immediately come to mind one is a Jesuit refugee service I actually trust them the best thing about being in an oppressive refugee service, <laughs> gender oppressive. Now the Jesuits are very, um, one of the things we used to say about Jesuit refugee service is because when I first started working, we had a number of Jesuits and we still do, but not as many. You've got a smart um, staff. You've got people who are well educated. And so we, we deliberate a lot as to what's good, we discern, we, um, we use the Society of Jesus to work out whether this is a good place to be or not because they've been there before, etc. Um, so you really have to be up for it. It's a really good, um, and we uh, certainly we still make mistakes, but it's a good organisation because I've worked with others like UNICEF, International Rescue Committee and others in consultancies and they face the same challenges, but they don't always have the same um, discernment tools. Um, but the other thing is peers. Um, you mentioned Paul Farmer yesterday when um, Paul Farmer died. There's at least three <laughs> colleagues of mine, one in Spain, um, who immediately posted um, how devastated she was. and. Um, so I have peers or friends or colleagues that I've worked with for decades. And when I'm not sure, I talk to them because I trust them. So I, 
I trust Jesuit Refugee Service and I trust my colleagues who are not all JRS people, but they're good colleagues. And we talk about things all the time um, as to whether this is um, what is good or bad or what harm it's done to me. So we share with, because you can't work in this space without being damaged. It's, it's impossible. I mean, I've just been in so many near misses and whatever that, um, you know, you have your own sort of issues you've got to deal with as well. That, and you try to make sure they don't impair your judgment. So that's when you need good colleagues. So what are the sorts of practices that you uh, undertake to restore yourself or to make sense of those near misses, whether they're moral catastrophes that don't happen or whether they're uh, physical dangers that are near. Yep. Um, so you can come in. To um, or moral catastrophe. What are the, what are the practices you do uh, to find your center again and, or simply to keep moving? Well, one of the things I have is supervision. Um, so I recommend that to everybody. Um, and what I mean by supervision, you can use other words. Um, it's not coming. It's not spiritual direction. It's not that. But like um, somebody who's professional who I can talk to at times about what's going on or a mentor who I have respect for, who's not going to put themselves into the conversation, but is going to listen. So supervision would be one. I've worked with many, many, I don't know if you know how it works. It sort of doesn't, it worked like this before. I think it's slightly changing, but I'll give you an example. So I'd be in the Balkans in Kosovo, you know, and um, we're in Pristina and the houses are all bombed or whatever. Then we hear, East Timor's got a problem. So people go from, oh, we've got to go to East Timor. So you go from the Kosovo to East Timor. Then you hear, oh, there's a tsunami in Arche. We've got to go to the Arche. So there's this kind of bullet um, of people going like this on contracts um, and agencies going, like Catholic Relief Service or IRC, getting um, the next contract where the crisis is. And so people um, that I work with are kind of going around the world and eventually you meet them again and you think, and they're just kind of like, it's just too much. So you really need to think, do I really need to go to another region? Do I really need to be a part of an agency that's responding like, <coughs> because it's addictive? Um, it's also um, for your professional career, you've got to keep moving. So it's changing now, but I had, like I can say, oh, I started on the Thai-Cambodia border, which is true. Well, that's like a notch or a bullet, and you've, you know, like, okay, I did that. Then I went here, oh, and I went, oh, and I was in Rwanda, and I was in the tsunami, and I was in, and it's just like, so then people go, oh, wow. And you start to exchange war stories, and um, you've got to get off that train, because it's too, it's, too much. Um, as I say, I, I'm not sure how much that still happens, but it does still happen. But that's the kind of spin that um, you've got to watch. You know, as I say, it's addictive. Yeah, it makes me wonder if you might reflect for a minute on the sort of tensions between the long term and the short term that you're mentioning, or the systemic and the individual, or the accompaniment versus social change and there are sort of different tensions mixed yeah. in there where do you like to find yourself and do you feel that you're best suited in one place or that as your career progresses or you age uh, moves forward that you belong in a different place or how do you think about those i think the area that i but you kind of can't do it till you've got credibility is to move to policy to shape policy mm -hmm. So like I gave the example of um, orphans being airlifted. Nowadays, I have a lot of colleagues who work on alternative care for separated children. And they would be working on policies with governments to stop children being um, necessarily removed from their cultural setting um, or unnecessarily removed, I mean. So 
but you can do that. Like one of my friends here in Boston who does that started her work as a, um, here in, first of all, in Vermont. Then she went to Romania when there was um, the orphanages in Romania. Now she works for Catholic Relief Service, helping countries to look at what's the best way to look after orphans or separated children. So once you've got a credibility, um, which isn't necessarily too hard to get, but then to move to best practice. And, um, and there's good agencies, I've just said Catholic Relief Service, it's a good agency where you not only bring your knowledge, but you help that knowledge inform practice. But of course then we've got to still have the whole debate as to whether we here in Massachusetts know what's best in Northern Uganda. So you have to partner with people and um, not just use our knowledge, but their knowledge. So it's, a, it's not an easy thing to do. Maybe if I give another example, I got into trouble last week. So last week, no, it was the week before now. I was in Rome. And I was in Rome and I was as a, uh, working as a psychologist. I was asked to work with 46 nuns in Rome on um, self-care and their leaders. Anyway, how did I get into trouble? I got into trouble because about day three, two of them said to me, um, Marianne, your ideas are too Western. You see, okay. Well, of course I'm a Westerner. Um, and so I said, well, look, I'm a psychologist. And that already, it also means Western concepts as such. <laughs> And so I said to them, I tried to empower them by saying, well, you know, somebody once told me this a long time ago in Kenya, and they said, you give us the sandwiches and we'll decide whether we eat them. So I'm giving you the concepts, but it's up to you as to whether it makes sense or not. I mean, I'm trying to give them to you in a way that is um, good research, it's empirical research, but <coughs> if it doesn't work, for you, um, adjust it, move it around. I can't be an expert on what works in Karachi and Egypt and in you know Lesotho. It's up to you. Um, so I, but it was humbling because I was kind of confronted and um, I was thinking, oh, I thought I was going quite well up until then. <laughs> you know, so that engagement. Um, now I think the psychology was right. Maybe the communication was wrong wasn't the right time, um, all those sorts of sort of challenges. So it's um, always that need to kind of keep reflecting back. What am I bringing to this discussion and my insensitivity or not? But there's no way in the world I'm gonna be able to talk internationally and be sensitive to every culture that I'm working with. But I can't then say, well, then I don't care. I have to kind of, work on it as such. I hope this is making some sense. I mean, it's part of the international, I mean, I work internationally, but what I was saying is last week I got <coughs> slammed for it a bit. And God, it made me think a lot. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, before we turn to, before we break out into groups, I, I hope we can reflect for a minute on you know, pivoting from what you just said about working internationally. Yeah. One of the, um, uh, concepts floated around in the work you do is that of global citizenship, right? Mm. And so how does that, what does that word mean to you or that phrase? Do you embrace it? Do you think it's a, uh, uh, a term that's has value? And um, uh, if not, why? And if so, in what ways? Well, I'm a bit naive on this area, Eric, so forgive me if it's too naive, but I actually don't like a Boston college the way we talk about privilege um, I think I think it's easy to hide behind it sometimes but in saying that it's a bit like what I was just saying it's unbelievable what rights we have that others don't have it's just unbelievable so global citizenship it's like you're kidding me <coughs> nobody has it's a it's a few of us who can do like I just went from Boston to Dublin to Rome to Oxford to Boston. 
I had to do all this paperwork, all these PCRs, all these vaccinations. You have to have enormous resources behind you to do that. And there's so many people who can't cross our border here. So it's, um, I don't have a sense of, um, I think it's an aspiration, but I think it's a centuries away from being real, unfortunately, because most people just don't have the resource. I mean, I often teach in class, like when I get to immigration, most of the time I've hardly ever had any problems because I've got an Australian passport and I look like what I look like. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, you can they hardly want to look at you so you can run through immigration almost mm -hmm. um, because of COVID and stuff. But um, I have traveled with people who can't even get in the airport. You know, so it's um, global citizenship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, we are miles away in my thinking about that. I mean, I think it's an aspiration. But, but you're all... you're um, you're using that as a sense of like equality for all around the planet of freedom of movement. Is that what you mean by it? No, I'm thinking it's just um, rights to determine your own self determination, mm -hmm. where you want to study, what you want to be. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest issue for us now and again i'm probably speaking naively is people now with um screens like mobile phones they know what is possible mm -hmm. and that creates all sorts of disparity because they can't go anywhere near it whereas um i'm just so aware that i can kind of trans i can go through, i mean i can go to the white house i can go to boston college i can go to all that trip i just did go to the vatican um, not for any other reason than I was lucky to be born in the right country. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking a bit like Good. that. It's yeah. just a raw talking. Um, and I've just met so many people who can't or, yeah, so yeah. it's tough. Well, thank you so much. This has been such a generative opening to our evening. Um,